There are times in a service you've said amen a lot. Huh? Praise the Lord. Even in a church of Christ. Here's the one for this morning. Wow. You want to say that one together? Wow. Wow. That is some song. Dick, some really, really needed song. Now look, I'm really glad to be here. Glad to be with Dick. Glad to be with Daryl, whom I love dearly. You are so fortunate both times. And probably the others that I don't know. But I've known this man probably 20, 25 years. And uh, Daryl, not that long, but love him that deeply. And I want to just say I'm glad to be here and get that over with. I want to get to this. I feel like sometimes, you know, like Jesus said to Moses, at the burning bush, take your shoes off. So the ground on which you're walking is holy ground. And I feel like that with this song. That is some song. And some theme. And if you've got any human blood in you, you are really going to be motivated in the year 2005 to understand that God has raised this church up for greatness. <coughs> Paul Harvey said, because a lot of us say, well, I'm, yeah, I'm just the average. I'm just the average Christian. You ever say that? I mean, what kind of church y'all got? Well, we have an average church of Christ. Paul Harvey said, if you're average, you're the best of the lousiest and the lousiest of the best. And I don't want to be average, not for my Jesus. I want to read you a text and then we'll get into this. Really, just look at the song and the Bible background that it brings to us on raised for greatness. In Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 10 are these words. Paul said, Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. Can I just stop and say, these are good first of the year words. Like you've never done it before, like you're making your New Year's resolutions. What I want to know, I, I want to know Christ and I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. Becoming like him in death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind... And straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal, to win the prize for which God called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now, the first stanza of the song talks about life as it always was, like it is today. And that sounds like bad news for today and the coming year, but it's, I hate to tell you, but that's the way it's always going to be. They said to Jesus in the parable of the wheat and the tares, shall we go and pull the tares out? And Jesus said, no, you're going to have to let the tares and the wheat grow together. Once in a while, somebody says to me, Marvin, do you think the world's getting better or worse? And the truth of it is, without evasion, is it's getting better and worse. The wheat's growing. I can talk to you all morning about the wheat of God growing all, literally all over this world. And I'm going to tell you the tares are also growing. Iraq proof of that. Some of the other things, some of the disasters, tsunami, some of those things that are happening to us. And Josh Groban sings, when I'm down and oh, my soul's so weary. When troubles come and my heart's burdened, my heart burdened be. And I'm still and wait here. In the silence. Till you come and sit a while with me. Can you relate to that? Are there people here in this audience who behind the masks that we all wear. And it's probably good that we wear them if we know they are masks and know how to deal with it. But I say to you, how are you doing? You say, fine. I say, I'm fine too. And on the inside, I'm dying. Dick read uh, from 
the little quote from Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. And I remember the time, and I think he was in Lubbock the last, one of the last two times I got to be with him, Lubbock in Victoria, Texas. And I think he was there that he, he said, you never, you never get to together a crowd of a thousand people anywhere for any reason, but that you have in that audience every known sin and circumstance. So I'm going to look out on this audience this morning. Many of you I know and many of you I do not know. And say you name it and we've got it in this audience. You name the sin and it is here. Either you've done it, you're doing it, or you're going to do it. And you name the hard circumstances. And they're here because that's the way life is. It's the way it always was. David, in Psalm 71, in verse 9 to 11... David's crying out to the Lord. Sometimes sometimes I don't like the songs. How about you? Sometimes they praise the Lord, and I feel real good about those. And David sometimes is a whiner. He sounds like me. He sounds like what I go through. He sounds like some of the things I say to God. And this is one of those times when he said, Oh, God, don't forsake me. Don't throw me away when I'm old and useless. My strength is gone and my enemies pursue me and they want to kill me. And they say, God has left him. Let's get him. Let's do him in. And I can relate. That's Old Testament. And then you come to the New Testament and, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, that had lots of ups and downs in 2 Corinthians 11 and verses 23 to 29. In all that long thing that I'm not going to read to you in Scripture, Paul says to them, because they thought, look, he's salaried. He, he's got the best of the world, like we say sometimes about the preachers, you know. And they, have to get out, they don't have to get out and work like we do. And they don't, they don't suffer like we suffer, you know. But you just don't know. I mean, we're all uh, stumblers. And Paul wrote and said in these verses, I've been in prison often. I've been beaten. I've been left for dead. I've been shipwrecked several times. I got enemies. I got enemies in the country, in the city, in the church, out of the church. Yeah, and you know, when I read over those, I get to thinking, surely not in the church because these are God's people. And we're not going to have enemies among the people here that we worship God with. But I remember I've been retired now from the Garnet pulpit for coming on nine years. And uh, I remember in South Lake, in the Dallas area, I was asked over there to their multi-staff congregation, and they just said, come over and talk to us. And I was still thinking, well, they're going to, what, what do you want me to speak on? And they said, no, 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 uh, just, you've been at this a long time, come over and just talk to our staff. And uh, so I said, well, okay. And uh, the preacher said a lot of good things about me, and they said, you guys might want to ask Marvin some questions. And the very first one was from the youth minister. This it slew me, Dave. Dick, he said, uh, how does a guy do it as long as you did and stay up? I mean, that's sad. You know, this is supposed to be fun. I mean, and, and it is, but there's, but, but reality says, I mean, God's people can love the deepest of anybody in the world and they can hate the fiercest of anybody in the world. And some of you know that firsthand. And, uh, then another one said, Marvin, I guess in all of your years of preaching, nearly 50 now, he said, I guess you've uh, made some enemies. And I said, oh, yeah, well, yeah. If you don't run into Satan, maybe you're both going in the same direction. I'm going to promise you that. I said, oh, yeah, I've, I've had my share of enemies. And, and they asked me the question, were most of your enemies in or out of the church? And I sadly had to say, well... Uh, most of them were in, in the church of my Lord. Where Jesus said to us in Galatians 5.15, if you keep on biting and devouring, take heed that you not dis be destroyed by one another. So life's always been that way, and it, and it always will be that way. And Groban talks about down and weary and full of trouble and, and full of burdens. And Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. And we all think we're unique. We all think behind the washed faces and the good clothes that we've got on, if you knew what was bothering me, Marvin, you'd never believe it because I'm the only person in the world these kind of things have ever happened to. And they come into my office over the 26 years I was at Garnett and say that. You're not going to believe this. You know, nothing like this has ever happened to anybody but me. And I probably had not heard a story like that in a day or two. Because let's face it, in the intimacy of this little family circle this morning, if we all let it all hang out, 
And we're supposed to be becoming a fellowship where we could do that, where it's safe to let it all hang out. But I promise you, if we let it all hang out and you told all you've done and all you've said and all the things behind closed doors and in the intimacy of your own heart you have done, if all of us did it here this morning, I think that we would laugh at each other for our lack of originality. Because we are all alike. And churches get in this. And there's splits and there's there's heartache behind us. And, and we get locked in and we have failures and we've tried so hard and our hearts are burdened and, and all of these kind of things. So that's how life is and how it, how it ever will be. But then comes that marvelous chorus. And there are four lines and, and, and four one words I want to give you. And the first one is accomplishment. The song reads, you raised me up so I could stand on mountains. That thrills me. You know, who are you? And you say, well, you know, I'm, uh, my self-esteem is not all that great. And I don't know that I can do so much. And you fail to understand who you are. I maintain if you read your Bible and understand it and internalize it, it wouldn't be possible for any one of us in this room to have a low self-esteem because you're pretty fantastic stuff according to your Creator. You've been created in the image of God. Genesis 1.26 I mean, I'm looking out in this audience and who do I see? I see people that were made in the image of God and for whom the Jesus who knows all about you thought you were worth dying for. Dick, you know Jim Caldwell. I remember all the thousands of prayers we've all heard and forgotten in church. I remember one Sunday we called on Jim, lead prayer, and Jim got in the pulpit and he said, let's pray, you know, and he bowed his head. And like Jim always did, he just got quiet. And after a while, you want to risk one eye. You know, you think he's having a heart attack or he's uh, got Alzheimer's and he can't remember. And after a long while, he said, uh, God, it is an awesome thing to be died for. And that's what God sees. Would you realize, wake up here in this, this audience here this morning, would you realize as... Uh, as you look into your own life and think about being, I just lost this thing here. I'm going to get it right. Somebody asked me this morning, I didn't know you were wearing a hearing aid, but anyway. <laughs> but as you look at who you are, you're worth dying for. And, and we're the only ones that God has to continue His work upon the earth. I don't know if you've got a mission statement or whatever. Here's ours at Garnett, and we're there in the process now. of you, you change these regularly to just kind of get a new fix on what you really are and what your job is. But we say at Garnett, we are a family committed to God and His Word and led by the Holy Spirit. We demonstrate our, our love by taking care of each other, building strong families, and reaching out as Christ to our community. I remember the first time I heard that because I wasn't on the committee. We got a big committee to do this. It's really good. 37 words, two sentences in what the church is all about, a synopsis of what the whole Bible is all about. And that last part, I thought it would say, well, we need to reach out like Christ, like Christ wants us to. And then I realized that we are Christ. We are the incarnation of Jesus on the earth. I mean, God sent Jesus to the earth to establish the church and put us in it. And then he went back to heaven and says, tag, you're it. And we reach out now as Christ. So as God views us, he said, listen to me, I've raised you up as an individual for greatness. Don't you dare settle for mediocrity. You be all that you can be. And churches don't dare just come to, to church on Sunday morning. What did Jesus mean when he said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church? He didn't have in mind some ragtag, shirt tail little church meeting together and making sure they're doctrinally accurate. That's important, but that's all we do. And there are more people that are concerned about issues and things like that than really becoming the great thing, the motivating force in the world that Jesus wants his church and his people to be. So you've been raised me up for greatness and accomplishment. Somebody said a lot of times we, we, uh, we limit ourselves by uh, aiming at nothing and then accomplishing it with great accuracy. And we copy one another's flops to prove we're orthodox. But, you know, there's, there's, better, there's better stuff than that. And, and you're going this morning for 700 people. And I hope you get it. Number, somebody asked me one time, are you interested in numbers? Of course I am. And you've got no right to say to me he's interested in counting up because and impugn my motives. 
I'm interested in numbers because each one is a soul. And my Jesus was interested in numbers. And when he looked at six billion plus, he said, I'm not willing that even one of those perish. So can you see this year in busting the thousand for the first time? Maybe it's a first. Is it be the first time? This year is the first year you'll bust a thousand and more and be thinking about other services and other ways to reach because we've been raised up to stand on mountains. And number two is overcoming. The word overcoming. We've been made to make it. We are not the frail people that we sometimes think we are. We've been raised up to walk on stormy seas. You know, Zig Ziglar talks a lot about, you call up, are all the lights on green? I don't want to leave the house if all the, all the construction is gone and the lights are on green. And you, you, you can't live that way. But sometimes churches do. But we've been raised to walk through on stormy seas. We've been raised to overcome. Lance Armstrong, what do you think about that guy, you know? On the page, front page of Sports Illustrated, testicular cancer. And they say to this man, you know, we've looked at you and you're going to die. You know, you're not going to make it. We don't think you're going to make it. And then he begins to show a few signs of progress. And they say, well, you know, this is wonderful. Uh, you're going to live. You're not going to walk, but you'll, you'll live. And then they said, well, you're going to walk, but you're never going to get on a bicycle again. And then <laughs> six times, six times, Tour de France. And the winner, and see this one, and so many others, so many, the survivors in tsunami, and so many others show us that we are a resilient, we are a powerful people. And it belies those of us that live here sort of cocooned in our way in church, and then something goes wrong, and we, 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 we break and run, and we break down, and, and we break up, and marriages go astray. See, we've got to be solution conscious and not problem conscious. We've been made to survive. We've been made to overcome. Somebody said, it isn't so much what happens to you as what you do about what happens to you. And that, by the way, is what's happening in this church and how it's being blessed and how your life is going to be blessed. Because so this happened and so a death and so a, a loss of job and so terminal illness and all those bad things that we're not trying to put down. But we're saying no matter what happens, we serve a God who's bigger than that and he can raise us up to walk on stormy seas. I need a lot of strength. So the third stanza and the Bible says I'm strong. Well, I'm not. I'm weak. But that isn't what the stanza said. It says I'm strong when I'm on your shoulders. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. The writer said I'm strong when I'm on your shoulders. See, in church strength, we, uh, we, we in the world today, and we can't get away from this. We want a good building, and you've got want a good location. We want a good advertising plan, a good this and a good that. But while we're doing all of these things, see, we could get in the practice in the, in the colony's church of growing Goliaths rather than developing Davids. And all of that is out of 1 Samuel chapter 17 when God had a skinny little old boy and cut off blue jeans and a little, little slingshot with five smooth stones go out against a man named Goliath of the enemy, nine feet plus tall. Shaquille O'Neal is a baby compared to this bird. God sends him out and he says to him as the giant looks down at David and sees him coming. You need to read 1 Samuel 17 early in this year and realize he said, I got this sword and this uh, shield and I've got this and you look like a dog and a child coming out to me. And David says to him, you come to me with sword and shield and spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God. And the battle, he said, is the Lord. Don't ever forget that. The battle is his. It has nothing to do with our location and our building and our size and, and some of the programs that we do. These are all things we want to do and get involved in order to let God go to work with us because we're strong when we stand on His shoulders. Well, Paul had a thorn in the flesh. It was called in 2 Corinthians 12. I don't know what it was. One guy told me it was a nagging wife named Thecla. I don't know where in the world he got that. <laughs> Another guy said, no, the wife's name was Grace because he said, I begged the Lord to remove this thorn. He said, no, Grace is sufficient for you. I don't think that was, I don't think that was his wife. But Paul, you know, in begging the Lord, turn the lights on green. 
Would you please, Lord, I've asked you, come on. You're the one that made the world in the first place. You could, you could make me able to make my car payment. You could give me a job. You, you could get me over this terminal illness. You could do this and do it. Come on and do it. And God said, my grace is sufficient. You need to look at the fact that you're strong when you stand on my shoulders. You're not strong when you just get solution to your problem. So Paul said in that chapter, therefore, when I'm weak, then am I strong. Now, how in the world could that be? And it's only when I realize I can't do it and I have no strength that I look to the one who has it and offers it. And so Paul would say, when I'm weak, then am I strong? And it says in the end of Hebrews, we'll read that. It says at the end of Hebrews chapter 11, that that great uh, uh, hall of faith, hall of fame, faith hall of fame in the Bible. By faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and so forth. At the end, he's just so inundated with this tsunami of, of accomplishments because of their faith that he says, who through faith, he says, conquered kingdoms that administered justice and gained what was promised and shut the mouth of lions and quenched, quenched fiery flames and escaped the edge of the sword and, and, and turned weakness to strength and became powerful in battle and routed mighty armies, you know, and he's saying they were the forerunners of us who are walking in the same light and following the same God. And so we could say about the colonies, church, we were raised to glorify the name of Jesus. We were raised to preach the gospel to the lost. We were raised to proclaim hope to the hopeless and love to the unloved and fill the earth with righteousness as the waters cover the sea. And then last of all, we're saying, yeah, but Marvin, I I want that. I want to be on the mountain. I want to walk on the stormy sea and I want to be strong. You know, how in the world am I ever going to do that and the last word is partnership because the last line of the song says you raise me up to be more than i can be oh the little old book of philippians is great preacher fashion it's got four points four chapters all begin with p everything's there except a poem and the whatever else is to end the thing but he says christ becomes your pattern uh 120 philippians 121 uh i uh for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Chapter 2 becomes our pattern to follow. Uh, let this mind be in you. Chapter 2, verse 5. That was also in Christ Jesus. He becomes our prize. I read that in the lesson text, 314. I press forward toward the prize. And you say, oh, Marvin, I want Jesus to be my purpose. And I want Jesus to be my pattern. And I want Jesus to be my prize. But I just, I lack, as my son-in-law likes to say, I'm out of gas. You ever been there? That's what he says when I got in the, have you ever felt I need to move on and I cannot? I ran a marathon. That's the craziest thing I've done in my life. It was fun too though. But I know what it is to hit the wall. And I know what it is to split emotionally into two people. I had an argument with myself and I said to myself, self, we're stopping. And the other self said, no, we're going on. And the other one said, you go, I'm staying. I mean, it was, it, I mean, it was so much like that. You can't believe, you know, and you need help to go on. And, and my son-in-law Dale would say, I'm out of gas. You don't understand. You tell me what I ought to do, but I'm out of gas. I remember a time when we needed to do something in the church and he needed to do it. And I needed to do it. And he said, I just can't. I'm telling you, I can't do it. And you've been there. You can relate to that. So I, I, if Christ becomes my purpose and my pattern and my prize, I need some power. And that's why 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ. See, I can't. I'm ready to throw up my hands and throw in the towel. But through Christ. See, because if God be for us, who can be against us? Daryl told me he didn't write that second stanza, but he arranged the song and did a great job with the song. And here's that second verse. Because it's the way life can be for you in this church if you want it to be this year. And the way it really ought to be. Really ought not to be any other way. And it says, well, there is no life, no life without its hunger. Each restless heart beats so imperfectly. Oh. But when you come and I'm filled with wonder, sometimes I think I glimpse eternity. It reminds us that we're all stumblers. Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. I remember a man, we were about to ordain to become an elder, and he said to me, just in the, in the honest confession of facing being ordained by the church to be one of its elders, I feel so unworthy and I feel like such a stumbler. And you've got to understand that's all God's got is stumblers. 
But God can write as well with a 19 cent ballpoint pen as he can a $50 match set. See, because he's doing the writing. You're just the pencil. So God doesn't need power. He created a universe. He doesn't need beauty. He painted a sunset. He doesn't need brains. The, the foolishness of God is greater than the wisdom of men. What he needs are willing people. I'm not talking to a congregation of willing people. You know, are we starting off 2005? God help us being willing. Well, are we going to let one year's gone? All right. So let's do this. Let's all respond this morning without the loss of one. All of us in our heart respond to the words of this song and the words of God and God himself. And some of you will want to come forward and respond. But let's talk about it this way. Will we let the song he raised me up so I could stand on mountains? Will we let the song motivate us, inspire us? Or will we let the word of God that tells us those things <clears throat> lead us on, make us better than we are? Will we allow God to raise us up to greatness, to stand in as an individual in this church, to stand on mountains this year? Walk on stormy seas. Give us strength as we stand on his shoulders. Will we allow God to raise us up to more than we can be. I'm asking you as individuals. All of you. To make that decision this morning. Wouldn't it be great if all of us did. We don't, we don't know and we don't need to know. The only ones we'll know about it. Because some of you might want to say. Hey this is a good day. First Sunday of a new year. I'm going to start my walk with Jesus. You'll become a Christian today. Baptized into Christ. Forgiven of every sin. Had the Lord add you to his blood bought church. Or some of you will just plainly come home. Because you haven't been home. That's what church is, not so much be good, do good, it's come home. And we're going to sing this invitation song, and we'll all make the response, hopefully, where we are. And some will make it by coming forward and saying, I want to stand out and let God raise me to stand on mountains. If you need to respond, would you come forward right now while we stand and sing?